first of all, I'm going to take you to the town that I grew up in. So, it's one of those towns where you come out of the station and the first thing that you're met with is the car park. A large car park lit by two phosphorescent lamps. And then you take the road down through town, past Dorothy Perkins, past Marks and Spencer's, past the gas station, past McDonald's, until you get to the next car park. Very important place, this. And obviously the pub. And that's the pub that we all got served in when we were 14. The sort of pub that has sticky carpets and smelly toilets and a man with one arm behind the bar, one very pronounced arm which can always pull pints very quickly. Now in this pub, there is a girl that sits at the window and stares out across the town. And on May Day, she has a plan. She is the landlord's daughter. She is Janet. And she's all black fingernails and band t-shirts and a desire for something else. Now at school, they call Janet the frigid one. Or they make stories up about her. Oh yeah, you know Janet, yeah. Yeah, you know Janet, you know Janet, you know Janet, don't you? Yeah, she's the one who was, um, oh yeah, she was at Dave Foster's party, yeah? And like, she snogged him in the kitchen, yeah, and he fingered her. Yeah, and then she was on her period and the blood went everywhere and went all over the oven and went all over the <laughs> fridge and it went all over the picture of Dave Foster's dad on the fridge and now he's got Janet's period blood in his beard. <laughs> that sort of story. But Janet knows that on this night, the sun has just set and the moon is hanging like a great orb of glowing feminine power just above her head. She knows that there's something else. So she goes out and she squeezes her way through the people in the pub. We're all like, way! And beer and a little bit of a squeeze here and there. And she jumps on her bicycle. And off she goes. Past Dorothy Perkins. Past Marks and Spencers. Out, out, out through the town. To the ring road. And at the ring road, there is a forest that opens up. It's one of those places that you're told not to go. There are empty cans of aerosols scattered on the path and burnt out mattresses and wrappers and things which you don't really want to look at. And she walks through, through the forest, lit by moonlight, and she stares up at the canopy above her, watching the stars come out. The air gets thicker around her as she walks in and in and in. And she's heard that there are parties here sometime. Not the sort of parties that the girls at school go to. The stranger things. The bonfires. And people in odd costumes. So she walks through until she gets to a clearing. And on the ground under her feet, Tiny white flowers are growing, and she carves a snail trail with her silver trainers until she gets to the end and a well. And at the well, there's a single red rose growing. She plucks it, and as she plucks it, she hears something. I need your loving, ooh, like the sunshine, like the sunshine. And somewhere in the forest she can hear a party. And she's just about to set off when her hand takes hers. And there, at the end of her arm, is... It's quite hot. He's a bit indistinct because this is a fairy tale and they don't really go for detail. But he is definitely the most attractive man she's ever sort of kind of vaguely met in a forest. <laughs> and he's standing there and he offers her a cigarette and she looks all sort of charming and sweet. No, she doesn't. She's absolutely worth past. She's dressed like a samurai. She has a gold band around her head and she's got John Wayne in her hips. And she says, yeah, give me that. 
and he leans in for a kiss. And something happens and the world changes. And the earth underneath the well shifts. And they're transported to another place where their bodies can interlace in deep pleasure and joy and sigh. And it's as if she's been somewhere else entirely when she stretches herself finds herself alone, under the sun, on a bed of crushed grass. And she tightens the red band around her head, and she tightens her gold belt, and out through the forest she walks, hops on her bike, a little sore, a little unsure, and cycles all the way home. Now six months pass quickly in this town and it's getting to that time of year where the pub in the fire is roaring. Now pity it's not actually a real fire, it's a gas sort of thing, but anyway it's kind of nice, people keep their hands warm. And Janet is working a shift for her dad. Pronounced pint pudding with a grin. But not really. She's not feeling very thin at the moment. And her skin is as pale as milk. And her eyes are as green as any glass. As you can see in the glances of the girls around the bar, that they can tell what's going on under her skin. They don't need to make up rumours about her now. There's something there that's true. But before anyone can talk to her about it, she has jumped out of the pub and she has escaped from their searching eyes and she is back on her bike and cycling, cycling, cycling through town until she gets to the forest, leaps off, leaves the bike and walks through the wood. Now this being a fairy tale, the man she had sex with doesn't have a mobile phone and is not on any form of social media. So she's just been left with this feeling of unrest and something growing in her belly. And she walks through the forest until she gets to the clearing and the moon is high and the air is cold. And she walks to the well and she calls his name. Tam Lin! Tam Lin! Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Until she sees again, this time a double rose, and she picks it, and she pricks her finger on the thorn, and she licks the blood, and she thinks about other places that she could prick, and other blood that she could shed. And as those thoughts are swirling through her head, she feels a hand take hers, and there he is, Again, still indistinct. I should go into more detail about his appearance. But still the sexiest man she's ever seen, even though he's a bit of a dick and he should have at least written a letter or, I don't know, sent some sort of fairy message to her. But he says, why would you think about hurting the child we've got between us, Janet? And she looks at him and says, I can't even really see your face. I don't even really know if you're human. Where did you come from and where will you go? Will you be here with me if I choose to grow this child within me? And he takes her hands and he tells her an extraordinary story. How seven years ago he'd come to this very spot by the well and fallen asleep in the sunshine and woke to feel a cool hand on his brow and opened his eyes to see the fairy queen. And she had wrapped him in a mantle and dragged him through the well to fairyland, which is sometimes known as hell. But it was quite a good hell. This is a sort of party rave, fantastic, joyous, nighttime, fun place. At least it had been for seven years. But Janet, he says, Janet, Janet, every seven years, 
the Queen of the Fairies pays a tithe to hell. This year, it will be me. But you, Janet, because you chose me, you can save me. If I tell you what to do, will you save me? And Janet thinks about it. And thinks about it. And says yes. So on Halloween, she goes to Miles Cross. Always happens at a crossroad, this sort of weird fairy shit. And she waits until midnight, as she's been told. And there, coming off the ring road, she sees them. This fairy horde of sort of ravers, these people in strange costumes and outfits, and three horses, three actual horses, come trotting past. First, there's a brown horse, and then there's a black, and then at the end there is a white horse. And she sees that its rider is her lover. And she wraps his tail in her hand and she pulls the rider down and in her arms, in her arms she holds him until he suddenly starts growing and growing and he gets hairier and hairier and she finds that in her arms she's holding a wolf. And the wolf's head is by her neck and its jaws snap and grab, but she holds on. She holds on and she holds strong. And then she feels in her arms this wolf swell, swell and grow until it is a bear. And this bear has enormous claws and he slashes and cuts her. But she holds on. She holds on. And the bear shrinks and shrivels until it's a fizzing and biting adder. And its fangs are snapping at her neck and she holds on. She holds on and in her hands the adder turns to a rod of steel, a brand burning her hands, and they blister and they blister, but she holds on, she holds on, she holds on until she can hold on no longer, and she throws the brand down into puddle, where it fizzes and hisses and turns into her lover, naked as the day that he was born. She takes off her anorak and covers him in it and holds him. And just at that second, the sky cracks. And the horde of fairy ravers, we're not too sure what they are quite yet, this story's still in development, they keep, keep coming down, they keep coming down and until they stop. And from the clouds above her, Janet can hear the roar of thunder, the rumble of a, a furious, furious voice. And the Queen of the Fairies says, Tamlin, Tamlin, if I had known that you would betray me, I would have taken out your two great eyes and put in two of tree. Tamlin, Tamlin, I would have turned your heart to stone. But she doesn't do anything, because Janet has broken the chain. And the fairies disappear, and she's left there, holding this damp, naked man. Now, I like to think that there's an end to this story. And I like to think that Janet chooses her own path. Maybe she just lets him go. Maybe she keeps her prize. Maybe her prize is something completely different. But the best thing about this tale is that it's not really existed apart from just as a song, just as a poem. So it can go in many different ways. But Janet chooses her own path and chooses her own destiny. And I love her for it. So that is a tale of talent.